Well, I have mastered, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say I've mastered anything, but I um, have, have several different accents that I put on based upon how comfortable I am and, and what environment that I am. Yesterday I was at a, a Chamber of Commerce thing uh, trying to recruit other businesses to move to Nashville, so I put on my Nashville accent, which was pretty twangy, which I was reminded of by someone that was there with me. I don't know exactly what's going to come out today. I will tell you that I judge you as optimists. I think that if you clap before someone speaks, you are optimistic. And if you clap after they speak, you are either being kind or being polite. So uh, hopefully you're polite as well as optimistic. I thank all of you that did not wear a tie today. Uh, I was a little worried at lunchtime that I was going to be the only person underdressed for the occasion. Uh, I personally would like to meet the man that invented the tie and give him <laughs> one of those. I actually looked the guy up. I can't remember his name now, but it was a long time ago, and I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> um, geez, I look out at you, and I see a marvelous, young, ambitious, talented, and bright group of people. I want to thank Megan Chavez for being the introduction and asking me to uh, come to speak to you. It's not often that I get a chance to be with a, a great group of young people like this. Uh, Megan and I have some common history. Her parents and my wife and I are friends. We both moved up here from Texas. And her dad is an important part of the company that I have the honor of leading right now, which is a company called LP Building Products. On the New York Stock Exchange, it's known as Louisiana Pacific Corporation, and it has a symbol LPX. I'm going to start with some expectations that by you being here, I have of you. You're a select few. I mean, it's not everybody that gets to go to the Owens School of Management of Business at Vanderbilt University. I think you would admit that there's only a few number of people that can afford it. <laughs> and there's even fewer that are bright enough to get in here. So I respect you all. I know that I wasn't bright enough to get in here, and I know that I'm still not. But I think by you being here, it obliges you to accomplish more. It obliges you to go out and contribute more to the world. I get asked to speak in a lot of different places. Uh, some of them I take and some of them I don't because it does require a little bit of work if you don't want to totally embarrass yourself to get ready for one of these. But as I was uh, reminded uh, every time I accept one of these is this famous Demosthenes uh, quote around standing up and speaking in front of people. As he said, a vessel is judged to be sound or cracked by the noise it makes, and so too are speakers. Now, see, the great part about that is that you get to be the judge, and I have to get up here and make noise. So what am I doing here? And I ask myself that every once in a while. I think it's obviously because I have a pretty fancy job. I'm also local. And what I understand is that you can't get a cheaper speaker than absolutely free, right? <laughs> so this costs you nothing, and hopefully it will not be the, the old proverbial case that you get what you pay for. <coughs> I think that when you have to stand up in front of a group of people and say a few words, you should have a couple of objectives. And I have three today. I would like to be moderately entertaining, and it's okay to laugh. I have a very dry sense of humor, and I enjoy laughing, so if you do, then I will as well. I hope to be uh, moderately interesting to you, and then my third objective is to hopefully leave each and every one of you with some nugget or some insight uh, that I have gleaned from my last 34 years uh, fighting with corporate America. You have a job as well, and this is your job. Keep the best and shuck the rest. 
and that's kind of been my motto of how I've tried to learn stuff all along, is you can usually pick up one or two things that are useful to you. I want to begin by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, I thought that was way too kind of an introduction. Uh, I began my work career at 17 years old when I got out of high school and I went to the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, I haven't written any books, but I've read thousands of them. I haven't invented any products or started any large company, but I find myself running one right now. I'm not famous and I'm not very well known unless you like to go to LP Field. Uh, but I do lead over 4,000 people in the, internationally in the accomplishment of goals. I think that uh, there's probably only one time when I really run fast, and that's away from any opportunity to be on TV. So thank you very much for, uh, for filming this for me today. <laughs> I think the camera is scary because you can't deny what you said or what you actually did in a place, but I'll put up with it since it's Megan. So after I went offshore and got enough money to go to school, uh, I did go to that bastion of higher learning, LSU, <laughs> which we tongue-in-cheek called Harvard on the Bayou. Uh, I garnered a couple of degrees there. I think I successfully completed in seven years or eight years what you people could do in two or three. Uh, but I was proud of myself. And I started my professional career after I left the oil rigs and left school, of all things, as a logger. But today I run one of the large uh, forest, publicly traded forest industries companies in the United States. And I can tell you that it has been a heck of a ride. Now, Megan called me up and she said, what are you going to call your talk? So the advanced building for my talk was this thing called lead with your hat. Now, I don't want to disappoint any of you that are sports fans and thought, because there was a picture of a football helmet up there, right? This has absolutely nothing to do with football. But what it has to do and what I want to talk about, I think, has an awful lot to do with the game of life and the game of business, and particularly the game of leadership. As again, I think you are all obliged to leave here and go be leaders. So I hope I didn't disappoint you that I'm not going to talk about sports. There's probably a lot of people in the room who say, whew, boy, I didn't want to come here if it was sports. So let me give you the, whole, the Paul Harvey, though, behind that title. I have a longtime friend. He's a business associate, and he's also the CEO of his own company. And he's a man that I greatly admire. I admire his accomplishment. I admire his value system. I particularly admire his sense of humility. And I admire the fact that he is absolutely the master of the understatement. About eight years ago, I took on the unpaid job of trying to turn around an industry association that was going broke. It was floundering and it was headed downhill. That association had been around for about 40 years and I had been a member of that association for probably 20 of those 40. So I did volunteer to be chairman and took on the task of the resurrection of that association. To make a long story short, we did write that organization after its near-death near experience, and today it's doing well. My friend, who is now the chairman of that association, but was a member I asked to be on my executive board as we tried to turn this association around, paid me a compliment while I was the chairman. He simply looked at me one day and he said, Frost, he said, you lead with your hat. And I never forgot that. See, this guy was a college football player. He played an interior offensive lineman position at 177 pounds, <laughs> often going up against defensive opponents that were twice his weight and twice his size. 
And the expression, lead with your hat, was an expression that his coach used to him, his college football coach. He said, Carmichael, you lead with your hat. And what his coach meant by that was he stuck his face right in the middle of the action, and he committed to that play until it was over. <laughs> he led by example. It wasn't about being super fast, super big, or having super talent. It was about committing to a course of action and then sticking with it until it was accomplished. So coming from him, a man a few words first, but secondly, a man who had actually lived that mantra of leading with your hat, it was one of the nicest things that anybody's ever said to me. One of the, uh, my secretary told, me, secretary told me that you would recognize that, so. <laughs> I don't have any idea where it's from, but she told me you would recognize that. One of the most commonly asked questions that I get from young people in business when I interact with them is, did you start out with the goal of becoming CEO? And that's a pretty easy answer and a pretty short answer when you're on the business end of a chainsaw. No way. I didn't have any idea that I'd end up where I am right now. The follow-up question then is kind of this quizzical look and say, well, you seem to have defied the odds or had some type of an improbable career path to end up where you are. How did you do that? And although probably the best answer to that question is dumb luck, people don't accept that, so then I add a couple of ideas. And these are the ideas that I want to add to you. The first is the notion of I'll do that. Of raising your hand and saying I'll do that. And the second is the concept of tenacity and persistence. Now I've found and observed that people either get where they're going or they don't get where they're going for an awful lot of reasons. But I think why I got where I was going was that at an early age, I started looking around for things to do, and when something came up, I said, I'll do that. Wow. Wow, an amazing number of people around me that were much more talented and much smarter did not. That's a differentiator. That's a big differentiator in business and in life. Now, it's as simple as this, and you'll be able to relate to this, and hopefully you go home and you look in the mirror. How many times have you sat around a table in a business meeting or in a classroom, and the person that's leading the effort or the exercise, the discussion that is going on, points out that something needs to be done? Have you ever noticed how busy everybody gets all of a sudden? They're on their Blackberry, they're going through their briefcase, they're taking notes profusely for the first time. And what are they doing? They don't want to make eye contact with the person that's asking for the work to be done because they're afraid they'll get the nod. I'm sure you see that all the time. Well. The opposite of that is you being the one that, instead of looking down, looks up and says, I'll do that. And I'd like you to remember that. Because that's what made me move from being a chainsaw operator to where I am today. One of my personal favorite career stories, which will probably bore you to death, but I'm going to take the chance here. Now, this is personal, and the thing is, is it's real that illustrates this point. Back in the late 1980s, I was a forester as part of a mill management team, and my job was to supply all of the incoming wood to this very large paper mill, pulp mill complex. 
That was a billion dollar asset. It was the only world class paper mill in the eastern part of the United States. I was kind of the odd person out of that mill management team. You know, most of my work took place outside the gate. And besides that, I was a lowly forester while they were PhDs in paper chemistry and engineering and had those fancy educations. There were about a thousand people, actually I think there was a thousand twelve when I left that plant that worked in that plant. There were four labor unions and it was a very complex and very hectic work environment. Now in a paper mill or a big manufacturing complex like that, there's sexy jobs and then there's jobs that aren't sexy, right? And the sexy jobs are around the technology. They're working in the pulp mill or they're working around these high speed paper machines. And nobody wants to be exiled to the woodyard. There's a whole story around that as well. But anyway, we were having problems at that mill in the woodyard, supervisory problems, and the vice president and general manager of that complex wanted them fixed. And so when he said he wanted them fixed, everybody around that table looked down and got real damn busy because nobody wanted to take the job of working in the woodyard. And I looked up and I said, I'll do that. And I remember he peered over his glasses and he said, Frost, what do you know about running a wood yard in a unionized environment? And I said, well, I said, it's a continuation of our process. We bring them in and drop them off. I said, I've got wood yards out in the mill. I said, I'll learn the union stuff. Doesn't seem too hard to me. So I took on the job of running the wood yard as well as outside the mill operations. About six months later, the mill passed a capital job. It was a $20 million capital job, I remember it like yesterday, and it was to build a new landfill for the mill as a repository for the sludge and ash that are wastes out of that process. Well, nobody wanted to be the lord of the landfill. I raised my hand since I already ran the wood yard, and I said, I'll do that. And the GM looked at me again, he says, Frost, what do you know about building landfills? And I said, well, maybe I can tell you, just scrape out two 20-acre holes and, and fill it with a rubber liner. It, <laughs> it can't be that hard. And I said, well, we've got a heavy equipment up in the woods, and we build roads and bridges all the time. Doesn't look, doesn't look too hard. I said, I'll do it. Well, to continue this story, there's two more pieces, and then I'll get off of it, right? So the next thing that happened is the guy that ran the mobile equipment maintenance shop in that plant that took care of all the bulldozers and the forklifts and the scooters and everything that kept product flowing from one place to another within that mammoth, uh, that mammoth facility, that guy retired that ran the mobile equipment maintenance shop, and the boss didn't want to fill that job, he just wanted somebody to take it on. Well, I volunteered for that, and he says, Frost, what do you know about running a mobile equipment maintenance shop? And I said, well, we have logging equipment up in the woods, and we fix that all the time. I said, it can't be that hard. So I took over all the rolling stock in the mill. Now, this is the good one. About six months later, remember, this is a huge plant. It's unionized. You've got the segregation of duties. So we had a fancy group of people called Central Facilities Organization. And what they were is they were 23 janitors. They cleaned up after the other 1,000 people. And the guy that was the supervisor of the janitors got mad, got fed up with the union BS, and he quit. And the boss needed somebody to run the janitors. I'll do that. I'll never forget. The guy looked at me and he kind of goes, Frost, what do you know about janitors? And I said, that was my first job out of high school. I said, I know all about janitors. I said, I know those guys and I like them. I'll do that. So here's the punchline. Two years later, when that vice president and general manager decided to retire and that complex needed a new general manager, I was sitting there. I controlled the dump. I controlled how everything in the mill moved from one place to another. I kept everything fixed. I controlled the raw materials, and I kept the toilets clean. <laughs> Who do you think ended up vice president and general manager without knowing a darn thing about making paper? And who do you think was astounded that they didn't get that job. And the difference was one person looked up 
and everybody else looked down when there was something to do. If you don't remember anything else I say today, think about that. Because you are being prepared in this class, this program, to look up more than everybody else. Calvin Coolidge said something to the effect that persistence has solved and will solve more of the problems of mankind than any other human characteristic. I know you're looking at the stork and the frog, and that's me. The frog is me, if you don't know that. <laughs> now, somewhere along the line, I'm going to give the credit to my farmer's daughter, Kansan-born mother, who drilled into my head this idea of being persistent and tenacious. Because she didn't let me quit anything from the time I can remember until the time I got out of the house. And my motto became, I would rather wear out than give up. And I observed that often around me, many other people drew a line. And what I thought is they drew the line pretty early in the contest. So there's lots of ways to get to the top of the business food chain. But these were my two strengths, if I go back and I really separate all the BS from the buckwheat. I mean, I'll do that, and just simply being tenacious will get you a long way. With your obvious intelligence and the training that you're getting, if you just add those two components to your repertoire, there's no telling what you can accomplish. So Megan, when I was interacting with her, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And like she sent me this list of world hunger, right? <laughs> Let me give you this list that she wanted me to do in, in, 50, in 50 minutes. She said, how would you describe your leadership style? What have you learned about leading during times of change, especially in response to the recession? How do you make strategic decisions? How do you identify opportunities? Are there any decisions that you have made that, uh, it was a pretty polite way she said that, in your current role that you would change? I call those do-overs. Uh, what are the key challenges that your company faces over the next decade? And then what are your thoughts about emerging countries and their threat on your business? Thanks. I mean, <laughs> maybe after I retire I can get a job doing that. So I can't do justice to any of those in the time that we have to share here. So I'm going to go uh, follow my own rule, which is go where the energy is. And I'm going to talk to you about pieces of some of those that I think might be interesting to you. The first is I want to talk about leadership. I have two internalized definitions of leadership. One is mine. And as you can see up there, one is not mine. Eisenhower said that leadership is getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. I made up my own based upon that, and I said that leadership is about creating an environment in which others can become more successful. Now, there's a common theme there. You know what it is? The common theme is, is that leadership is not about you. Leadership is about those that you lead. Remember that. Because you can get trapped into thinking that being a leader is all about you. And it's not. It's about those who you lead. I think the, the more that you can learn that, the quicker that you can learn that, the better opportunity that you have of becoming a better and better leader. I have learned that I think people do things for three reasons. Either it appeals to their intellect, which means it makes sense. It appeals to their affections, which means it makes them feel good inside. Or it appeals to their sense of personal well-being, which is some relationship between risk and reward. The better that you can line these notions up with those that you lead, the better chance you have of actually leading and the better chance you have of the people that you ask to follow you to do so enthusiastically. So, Megan, what's my leadership style? I don't know, ask your dad. He'll probably tell you. Uh, I think 
<laughs> Oversimply synthesized, I would describe myself in two ways. I think I am a vision and values leader, and I, am a, I know that I am a principle-based decision maker. I have a vision in my own head of how an organization ought to work. And I learned that by working in a bunch of them that didn't work very well. Okay? I have a strongly developed value system from which I will not deviate, and I do not apologize for that value system to anyone. In the company that I lead, LP Building Products, these are our six core values that stand above many others. Safety and compliance. You probably don't talk a lot about that in here, but we're a manufacturing operation and you've got to keep people from getting hurt. You also have to respect the environment and you have to follow the regulatory, uh, the, the regs that, that, that apply to your particular business. And what, what safety and compliance mean to me at the core of an organization is people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Ethics and integrity. You probably have classes in that, but I can tell you without a doubt in everything at all times, it is the most important thing that you can do as a leader is have ethics and have high integrity. Quality of product and service. Not only is this the largest financial risk that your business will encounter is the quality of your products and service, but more, even more importantly, it's where your reputation comes from. And you can't buy a reputation you have to earn it with quality of product and service. Respect for others, what that means to me is that everyone in my organization has value. Teamwork. I actually wrote this in my first letter to the shareholders when I became CEO in 2004. And I talked about how I was going to transform LP into a company where teamwork was one of its prime objectives. And I defined teamwork as none of us are as smart as all of us. And that's what it means to me. And then this notion of continuous improvement, which I think that we are all obligated, at least the people that work at my company, to improve and to grow all the time. These are the things that I am willing to lose my job over. That's a strong statement. These are the tenets that become the input to the culture at our company. But for that to happen, these are the things that I, as, as one of the leaders, have to live up to. And i got to role model those things. And that's a teeny little wire to walk on every once in a while. These are my expectations for everyone that works at my company. And these are my expectations for anyone that I put into a position of leadership. These are not principles of convenience or values of convenience. This is a package deal at LP. You buy them all or you don't buy any of them. It is a package deal. So what do I mean by principle-based decision making? Now that's a really vogue statement, right? I mean, you probably hear that all the time. I think Stephen Covey even wrote a book on it here not too long ago about principle-based decision making. But let me tell you how we live it at LP. In our decision-making intercourse with each other at LP, we, we define what we call as the, the senior notion behind any decision that we make. A decision has to be based upon a senior notion, and that senior notion must be aligned with that value system that I showed you a minute ago. What that does is it eliminates people from having principles of convenience. You know, as you're teaching an organization to operate this way, people know, hey, you've got to have a principle or the boss isn't, gonna, boss isn't gonna take your answer. So they'll come in and they'll make one up, right? So that the, so that the answer is a good answer. And you work people through that and eventually you create some consistency organ in your organization. You cr create some predictability in your organization so that people can guess how future decisions will be made. It creates tremendous alignment. It allows you to always have a why with a what, which I think is tremendously important when you're trying to communicate with people. You, in my organization, you aren't allowed to tell people just what you decided. You have to tell them why. And if you've got a senior notion behind that, 
People don't have to agree with your decision, but they deserve to know why and how you made it. And they'll follow you even if they don't like the decision that you made. So how does this manifest itself? And these are some of my, some of my favorite and some of my litmus tests, if you will. The first one up there you may snicker at, but that's the one I use on my legal department. Oh, I met a lawyer here a minute ago. You know, they come in and they razzle-dazzle you with every legal te technical point in the world about how you can do something that you shouldn't do. And I just look at him and I say, if that was your mother, how would you want her to be treated? And it's amazing. Five years later, my lawyers and my company, that's the first thing they say. If this was my mother, this is what I think we ought to do. And it's transformed the way that they do their work and put them back to, you know, the world's the world. But what's the right thing to do? And that's important stuff. In matters of communication, how much, how fast, how soon, how much ahead of time, what's the bad news? The advice that I give all of my people is let's treat people like adults. And most of the time they will live up to our expectations. Most of the time it's uh, some variation of the golden rule, which we all learned at some point in time when we were young. And we start most of the discussions in our business around problems that we have to solve with the simple question, what's the right thing to do? Now, I have a corny belief, and some of you, I saw you snickering a minute ago, may believe this as well, but I think it's really easy to claim that you have principles when things are going your way, when you're on top. But I think that you only know whether you have principles is when it actually costs you something of value to live by that principle. Someone once said that your character is what you have when nobody's looking. Kind of fits together there. Let me give you a couple of other leadership style notions. I don't have to look up there. I've got it right here on my screen. This is nice. <laughs> I think that a good leader must be willing to role model. You need to practice what you preach. And that means you need to live under your own law. You can't do one thing and expect everybody else to do something different. Double standards don't work very well, and they don't work very long. Here's another popular term, servant leadership. Have you guys talked about that in here? The idea of service or servant leadership. I think that's pretty important. I think that a good leader must be willing to work as hard and as diligently for their people as they expect their people to work for them. I think that you also have to be as open and honest with your people as you expect them to be with you, or guess what? They won't. You're going to lead that. You're only going to get the openness and the honesty back that you project forward. Otherwise, they don't know. It's a risk. If they see you acting differently than they are, it creates risk in your organization. There's a couple of ideas. I'll go one more. I want you to think about this one. My observations in this world of business and the world of leadership is there's some words and some attributes that commonly go together. I think where you find arrogance, you will find insecurity. And I think that where you find humility, you're going to find confidence. Humility and vulnerability that you're going to find confidence. And it's a way to look through and around the people that you engage every day, and it helped. It's, very, it's been very helpful to me to understand what I think is an association there. I think that to be a good delegator, I'll clean this up a little bit from the way it was taught to me, to be a good delegator, you have to be willing and feel like that you can fix anything your folks screw up. 
And if you aren't willing to do that, then you shouldn't delegate that task to begin with. It's the wrong level of work. So delegation is not dump and run. Delegation is saying, I'm going to let it go. And if it messes up, it's still mine because I delegated it to begin with. And if you really think that you can fix anything your folks screw up, then you're going to become a good delegator and people are going to grow under your lead. I think that leaders should be quick to make their mistakes or to admit their mistakes. That's a novel concept, isn't it, in today's world? And I think that leaders should be quick to apologize when an apology is needed or warranted. You see, leadership to me, and hopefully to you, is an honor and it's a privilege. It's not something that just goes along with rank. Because leading involves followership, and I think you have to earn that. Abraham Lincoln said something to the effect that most men can withstand adversity. But if you really want to test a person's character, give them power. I thought that was cool. Because most, most of the time we're taught that you put someone in adversity and you test their character. But he took that to a whole new limit. <coughs> if you really want to know how somebody is, give them power. So let's move now to your second question. They get faster as we go. What are my learnings from what has been the worst housing recession since the 1930s? 70, 70 years. And I'm, I might look 70, but I'm only 59. So it's the worst thing that's been around since I've been around. Well, my dad taught me this one about two years ago. Because actually he was looking through a glass of bourbon. I was having one with him. <laughs> And I was feeling sorry for myself, and I was lamenting about, I got my chance to be the top banana, and the world fell apart. I'm not getting to do all the stuff that I wanted to do, Dad. And he looked at me, and he says, son, he says, you don't get to pick the time that you're in charge. He says, you simply have to take the cards you're dealt and play them the best you can. And that has been a tremendous learning for me and good advice from an 88-year-old man. So I'm going to put some of my learnings into buckets. Uh, there's a specific bucket about my particular business, which may be interesting or not to you, but I'll, put a, I'll talk about a perspectives bucket first. Some perspectives that I've acquired in the last four and a half years of really tough times. The first thing I want to talk about is this. The four paradoxes, you see that this? That was the Nashville this. Uh, the four paradoxes of leadership. Now, I think Russ Kidder was the guy that actually wrote a book on this, and I'm, I'm going to terribly misparaphrase him because I, I usually take good ideas other people have, and then I just change them into what I like. But these are important for a reason. I'll tell you about that reason after I talk about them. You run into four tough things. The, the harder things get, the tougher things get, the harder the decisions that you have to make are that come at you. They become less clear. Because you run into, first of all, this paradox between the short term and the long term. The simple analogy I can give you is if you could imagine yourself as the captain of an ancient man of war sailing ship, and you were sent out to engage the enemy but you run into a huge storm outside a port. And you have the dilemma of how many cannons do you jettison overboard to keep the ship afloat to get to the battle that you have to fight. And that's the conundrum that many, many businesses are fighting right now and not having a feel for when this malaise is going to stop. Is you know, John Maynard Keynes said, in the long term, we're all dead, which will give you a very short-term focus. But what we're really talking about here is how do you survive but then still have the core competency left in your organization to capitalize on the upturn 
And when you go through times of change like this, it's just constant and it's magnified. There's a paradox between the good of the individual and the good of the many. I think there was an old Star Trek thing on that one. In the, in the last Star Trek movie, they talked a little bit a lot about that. But I could relate to it. And so when do you ask the few to sacrifice for the many? And when do you ask the many to sacrifice for the few? It is a paradox. There's a paradox that I think exists between this idea of loyalty and effort and performance and results. Now, I'm a sucker for loyalty and effort. I mean, obviously, from what I described in terms of my tenacity and all that, I really appreciate that about people. But how do you make the decision? I mean, to, to get loyalty, I think you have to give loyalty, right? But when the results and the effort don't match up, that's a paradox. What do you do about that? And then finally, you run consist constantly into this paradox that I'll call the difference between fair and equal. If you think about fair and equal as a triangle and equals on the bottom, and fair is at the apex, you know what the difference in the middle is? It's your ability to exercise judgment. The difference between treating everybody equally and then trying to determine fairness is judgment. It's how much judgment will your people allow you to exercise, which has to do with your credibility. And that is a constant paradox when things are tough. I think that, as I said, decisions that you face in very, very tough times come at you much harder. Now, why is that interesting other than an intellectual exercise to know? Because if you go through something like many of us are going through right now, you're going to sit in your office and you're going to go, why is this so hard? There is no right answer to this question between the short term and the long term, the many and the few. Why is this so hard? And you'll start to doubt yourself because you you're looking for the right answer. You know what? There's no right answer. There's just an answer. And that's why your vision and your values and your principles are so important. Because the only thing that you have to rely on to get through these to make a decision is you've got to go back and use those as your personal GPS to hopefully come up with the best answer because there isn't a right or a wrong answer. There's only the answer that you come up with. Now my second learning, and hopefully you're somewhat familiar with this, but I was introduced to this concept of black swans. Anybody read that book? Good for you. I would recommend to whoever runs this program that the book, The Black Swan, I can't remember who wrote it, become part of any business education. I wish that somebody had made me read it 30 years ago, but it wasn't written then, so that's my excuse. <laughs> and basically, it's a tough read. The guy's an intellectual bully that writes it, but it makes a very interesting point. And basically, the guy says that the things that will have the most dramatic impact on the success or failure of your organization are the things that are unknown or unknowable or that happen on the perimeter or the extremes of the strategy that you have. I'll give you a quick little anecdote how that's true. Anybody ever heard of St. Joe Land Company? Used to be St. Joe Paper Company. You might have heard of that. Anyway, they got out of the paper business and they ended up with a whole bunch of real estate in the panhandle of Florida. Well, just a few months ago, St. Joe Company lost 65% of its market cap in one week. And if they had sat in a room for a year and tried to figure that risk out, they would have never come up with it. And it was a leaky oil well off the coast of Louisiana, which cratered their real estate value in the panhandle of Florida. That's a black swan. That's, that's a black swan. I can give you a bunch of black swans that I had. I had $375 million of cash dry up on me in six months. I had $125 million of debt that I would presumably, without any problem at all, roll over. 
The day that I went out for my debt offering was the day that Lehman declared bankruptcy and the banking crisis started. And you couldn't get any money out of the market for the next six months. And I had to pay that debt off, $125 million, and I wasn't expecting to do that. I had $150 million invested in these auction rate securities, which were just as good as cash, only better. One day, the next day they were completely illiquid and $150 million went away. And then I had to settle a scurrilous lawsuit for another $50 million. And so if you don't think that has an impact on your cash forecasting in terms of what you think, how you think you've got things knocked or not, to have $350 million just vaporize on you in six months, those are black swans. Now punctuate that with the financial crisis and the ensuing recession. Because if you remember back, some of we were talking at lunch, you can't use contemporary information to judge the decisions that you made four or five years ago, right? That's like being an armchair quarterback. It's easy to throw on Monday and say, this is what I should have done in the heat of battle. It doesn't work. But there was nobody that was calling for that there was going to be a banking crisis a year before the banking crisis. There was nobody that said there was going to be this huge recession in housing. There was nobody that said that ARSs were going to become illiquid. Those are black swans. And it's important to understand that they can come get you. My third learning, or what I'll talk about as perhaps a relearning, and then I think this is important for you guys too, because I'm sure you study this a lot in this program. It's about planning. Eisenhower said that plans are nothing, but planning is everything. Some 60 years later, Colin Powell said it slightly differently. He said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So what does that mean? I think it means that there is merit to tenaciously developing and following and executing a plan. But there is also a great potential danger <coughs> and falling in love with any particular plan and getting too married to it. So in times of rapid change, I believe that the notions of agility and flexibility and speed of action are much better weapons than having a great plan. You need to have a whole bunch of plans, right? And you don't get too married to any one of them. And the little analogy I use there, if you think about it, is the way of the willow is often more successful than the way of the oak in trying to survive a hurricane. Think about that. Finally, from the perspective of uh, what all this means and what it does to you, <laughs> I was a much lo younger looking guy about five years ago. I didn't have these bags under my eyes and the wrinkles I got and the gray hair. But this is true. If it does not kill you, it will make you stronger. But I got to tell you, it's painful. We are, without a doubt, the company that I have the opportunity to lead right now, we are, without a doubt, much better at our business today. Because if we weren't, we'd be dead. So adversity will help you as long as you learn from it. I want to mention a few specifics. We got into a little bit of this at lunch. And before you cry foul, particularly if there's any professors in the room, now I'm giving you these perspectives on a real life basis based upon the fact that I'm in a very cyclical industry in a very cyclical business. But they ain't teaching you in this business school. This is what you learn in real life. Now, it may be heresy for some of you. And I apologize for that, but you have to come at it. You know, I didn't learn this in business school. I learned this the last four and a half years. First of all, debt service to a cyclical business is bad. So you can take all this junk you're learning about financial leverage and how great it is. It may be true, but if you're in a cyclical business, don't believe a word of that. It doesn't work. If you have debt at all, you better constantly be looking on how you can uh, push your maturities out as far as you can. I think that you have to constantly, in a cyclical business, try to keep variableizing your fixed cost structure. 
What happens in a business is when things are going good, people will come into you with good ideas and say, you know, if we bring this in-house, we can do this ourselves and we can do it cheaper. Well, that's a sign that you're fixing to get in trouble. Because although it's true, in the downturn, you're going to have to unwind that fixed cost structure. And you're going to have to get rid of that work. And you're going to have to fire your friends. And you're going to have to pay them severance. And at the end of the day, if you're in a cyclical business, you want to variabilize everything you can that is not one of your core competencies. You don't variabilize your core competencies, but you keep pressing at how do I make an arrangement so that I can get out of that if my market goes south. Uh, this is an obvious one. You can never have enough cash on the balance sheet. Now, the investment community really loves, really loves to hear you say that, right? Because that's a real good return on their money. But it kind of goes along with the other statement there that says, uh, I guess that's not on your, on your chart, but I think that buying back your stock with your cash is probably the last resort of what you do with that cash if you're in a cyclical business. Now, I'm going to offend somebody in here with this one, but this is first-hand experience. Your banker is not your friend. Why I say that is because your banker wants to loan you money when you don't need it, and they won't loan it to you when you do. So don't buy all that garbage that your banker's your friend, because they tell you that all the time, but they only tell you that when things are going good. There are always more productivity improvements that you can get. Whenever you think you've got them all, whenever your people come in and tell you they've got them all, there's always more that you can get. I think that tougher times as a leader require you to be more visible. They require you to do more communicating versus less. They require you to be more candid about the situation that you're in than less. Now, why is that important? It seems pretty obvious. But basic human tendency is, is if you're the leader and you're making harsh decisions and doing harsh things to your organization, what do you want to do? You want to hide. You want to hold up in your office because you don't want to look people in the eye that you might be firing tomorrow. And so you have to go against basic human nature to do that. So the tougher it gets, the more you got to be out, the more you got to communicate, the more you got to tell people exactly what's going on. Because people can accomplish much more than you think or they think if you provide them hope and you provide them decent information. Then there was a the question, what would you change? Uh, this was, I think, Megan's nice way of saying uh, there's some do-overs in the last four or five years uh, at LP. Well, this is kind of interesting. We were talking about it at launch, but we entered this downturn with a strategy that we called the salmon strategy. Kind of odd in that we referred to that inside. And what it really meant, it was three elements. In the face of what we thought was going to be a short, normal downturn of about 18 months, we were flush with cash. And so we decided that we would go ahead and complete a robust capital expenditure program, including building three new mills into the face of what was supposed to be a gentle dip in housing. We were going to pour the gas to our sales and marketing. In other words, just keep our foot on the pedal around the curve. And we were going to commit ourselves to a war of attrition against our competitors. Because as we looked at our reserves and theirs, as I used to say, I think we've got more mules in the pasture, we got more hay in the barn, and we got more gunpowder stored under the kitchen floor than they do, and in a war of attrition, we will win. Well, that was pretty interesting. I'd been in this business uh, four years ago, 30 years. I'd been through four downturns before this. And I said, you know, I've learned enough that I think I can get our company in this industry to be the first one to break the cycle. And we'll just power through it, and we're going to come out on the other side with a sea change in terms of our market share and our profitability and everything else. Well, I wasn't into that strategy very long before a CEO friend of mine. He was not a competitor, but he was in the industry, and he, see, he said, Rick, he chided me. He said, Rick, you know what happens to salmon when they swim upstream, don't you? Don't you? You know what a salmon is? Yeah. 
They die. Well, he was almost prophetic. So in hindsight, my do-over is I should have halted the CapEx work in midstream and not spent any more money. I should have slowed the sales and marketing down to meet the current market conditions. I should have done a better job at coveting my cash. And I should have realized that there were no sissies left in my industry. Every one of my competitors had just as much will and resolve to live through this thing as I did. Well, true. But some of them went bankrupt. But you know what? So what? They went bankrupt. Their capacity kept running because it was just under some other financial arrangement. And you think a company goes bankrupt, they go out of business, their capacity disappears, you get a different supply and demand relationship, and hopefully you get help on pricing. Didn't happen. Just put a different sign on the damn thing, and it was owned by bondholders rather than shareholders, and it, it kept running. So I learned a lot from that. And I think what I basically learned is to conserve your cash so that you have the ability to acquire in the downturn. The only way you can truly drive your competitor out of business is to buy them. Because otherwise, you don't have a control of what happens with their manufacturing capability. I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I want to end with perhaps something that's thought-provoking to you. I think maybe the most poignant thing that I have learned in the last four and a half years is about the job that I have. Now, obviously, I'm here because I got those three initials, that acronym CEO, right? We all know that that stands for Chief Executive Officer, Big Banana, Big Cheese, Lead Dog, whatever else you can think of. But I think what I want to say is perhaps that's what it stands for. What I've learned over the last six years is that CEO, to me, now stands for the three constituencies that I serve every day, almost all the time. And that's my customers, my employees, and my owners. Most of the time, in that order. You see, if you don't take care of your customer, there's no jobs for your employees. There's no need for your products. So you got to take care of your customer even in tough times. If you don't take care of your employees, you can't go out there and find a study to refute this. Every study that you read will tell you how you treat your employees is how they're going to treat your customers. So in tough times, your tendency is to take it out of your folks' hide. But if you do, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> They're going to go take it out of your customer's hide. And I believe that to, to finish this equation, if you take care of your customers and you take care of your employees, you get those two things right, then your owners are going to be taken care of in the long term. So. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that you had a good lunch hour and enjoyed it. <laughs>